There we go. All right, Rob. And we start off with the third step prayer, sir. Which is on page 63 of your big book. God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self, that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties, that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. And I do thy will always. Thank you, sir. And all right, we almost finished into action last week, but we're going to today. We didn't quite make it. So we are on page 87 and we're just a tiny bit more than halfway down uh, and we'll start if circumstances warrant. Page 87, everybody. If circumstances warrant, we ask our wives or friends to join us in morning meditation. If we belong to a religious denomination, which requires a definite morning devotion, we attend to that also. If not members of religious bodies, we sometimes select and memorize a few step prayers, which emphasize the principle we have been discussing. There are many helpful books also. Suggestions about these may be obtained from one's priest, minister, or rabbi. Be quick to see where religious people are right. Make use of what they offer. Yeah, so a couple of things here is just that um, strength in numbers, I would say. If you're able to uh, share in your morning meditation, uh, that's always going to be a positive. It also helps the other individuals that are participating as well. And one of the things I think that is kind of might be lost here in this paragraph is that if we belong to a religious denomination, which requires a definite morning devotion, we attend to that also. I underlined also because it doesn't take the place of this morning meditation. It's in addition to. So you want to make sure that you are, in fact, thinking in terms of your alcoholism, what it is that you want to do for the day uh, that's going to be um, helpful to others and, uh, and, and at the same time doing whatever it might be necessary with regard to your um, uh, morning devotion. Uh, so that's one of the things I, I always try to highlight here is that it's in addition to, it doesn't take the place of. Uh, they're very complimentary, no, no question about that, but that is something to, uh, to look at. And then this few set prayers, which uh, emphasize the principles we've been discussing, and we've been discussing the helpfulness of others. That's where we actually do our prayers and uh, our, our thoughts. They're supposed to be positive in that direction. Uh, we don't pray for ourselves except to be helpful to others. And, uh, and that's part of, part of what they're trying to say here as well. Um, books and suggestions from others, especially from priests and ministers or rabbis, um, they um, see where they might be right. Uh, Open-mindedness um, and accepting of, of other, uh, other uh, helpful um, readings is also uh, something to, uh, to really take, take to heart. And, uh, um, you know, the more robust that you make this morning meditation, that uh, you're doing, which is the second part of your step 11, if you uh, can recall where we are, um, is is definitely something to uh, to to um, to emphasize. And that is uh, the the robustness of it is going to pay back. So it's kind of what you put into it. You, you get out of it what you put into it. This is what they're basically saying here is put all kinds of stuff into it so that you can get all kinds of stuff out of it. Rob? Excellent. You know what, Leo, I'm not going to comment on that because the next part is my, one of my favorite parts of the book. Yeah. So I, I've got to get to it right away. So. <laughs> as we, Right at the bottom of page 87, everybody. As we go through the day, we pause when agitated or doubtful and ask for the right thought or action. We constantly remind ourselves we are no longer running the show. Humbly saying to ourselves many times each day, thy will be done. We are then in much less danger of excitement, fear, anger, worry, self-pity, or foolish decisions. We become much more efficient. We do not tire so easily, for we are not burning up energy foolishly as we did when we were trying to arrange life to suit ourselves. It works. It really does. 
Yeah, and so this is, and I know uh, I've heard this from the past, uh, uh, one of the uh, things that Rob likes to do, and that is, is that pause and um, uh, being able to um, take a second, think about what you're doing, what you're saying, where you are, where the other person is, and uh, trying to kind of, uh, trying to find that right thought or action to do. Um, you are not running the show. Ask for your guidance from your higher power. Um, and then from there, you actually can avoid this fear, this anger, worry, and self-pity and, and all kinds of excitement that goes with it. And, you know, your decision making gets to be a lot more sound. And that's something that I think is uh, lacking uh, when you're when you're letting the alcoholic mind control you, you, you your, your decisions are not uh, are not sound. They're basically of your want and need of alcohol. And, and out of that, you make all kinds of um, um, compromises uh, to yourself in order to uh, to make make things make things happen in your favor. Um, you justify things. And in this case, you want to do quite the opposite. You want to basically think about the other person, think about where you are, what you're doing, what you can say, what you can do in order to make it better, as opposed to making it worse, uh, avoiding the resentments, uh, the fears, the harms, uh, et cetera. Um, so it really does work. I think that that's a great, I've underlined and highlighted that that last uh, uh, line there. It really does. It really does work. Rob? Yeah, is that the shortest pay paragraph in the book? I believe it is. I think so. uh, it works. It really does. You know, the thing I, I like about the pause is I, I have a habit of saying things that I think are humorous, but can be taken other ways by other people. I always constantly, I, this is one of the greatest gifts that I have been given, okay, from Alcoholics Anonymous, and that is to pause to think before I speak, okay? My goal is not to hurt somebody. I really never have wanted to hurt people. But unfortunately, I have in the past because my brain works and says something before I think about what I'm saying. And it's only later on that I realize that I've hurt somebody. I didn't mean to. I thought I was being funny. I thought I was being, uh, you know, cute. You know, all the terms that you want to use, you know, in order to take the burden off me and place it on somebody else. Well, they're too sensitive. They're too that. So this is what I love about this program. It has given me the gift to pause and to remind myself constantly throughout the day, pause before I say something because I don't want to hurt somebody. Hey, Greg, Greg, we're on page 88, brother. So you know what? I constantly have to remind myself because I am not perfect. I am fallible. And I forget things quickly. Remember, we deal with alcohol, cunning, baffling, powerful. The first line there is remember, because we forget so quickly. Okay, So I'm constantly telling myself, Rob, pause, or you say or do something so you don't upset somebody needlessly. And it, it seems to work. Seems to, you know, as long as I, I remember that. But I constantly have to remind myself. Also, when I'm in doubt, take a moment, ask God, what should I do in this situation? Okay, what would you have me do? What would you have me be? You know, should I go right or should I go left? Or should I just stay where I am? You know, this is what this is all about, is now we are no longer running the show, running nilly-willy all over the place, causing havoc all behind us. Well, we keep going forward, thinking, you know, we're just, you know, as sweet as can be, but we don't see the carnage we have left behind us, the wreck, the toes that we have stepped on. Now we get to see these things and we get to deal with them. Step 10, when we make a mistake, when do we correct it? As my friend Katie J always says, now. When do we deal with it? Now. I apologize. I make it right. I make my amends, restitution. You know, if I take down your fence, I'm going to fix it or have somebody else fix it out of my own pocket. These are things that we we take with us that we've learned. We alcoholics are undisciplined, so we let God discipline us 
in the simple way we just outlined. But this is not all. There is action and more action. Faith without works is dead. The next chapter is entirely devoted to step 12. It sure is. Um, we are undisciplined, and I think that that's not only us, but there's also a bit of that that can be attributed to the human condition as well. So there is a lot of that that carries over even outside um, uh, of, of our uh, alcoholism and the fact that we do so much um, reasoning t with ourselves and 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 over and, and trying to justify things so this is one where you uh really do want to rely on your higher power and uh and let them um go to the work that is necessary based on what we've just read and we also have more action um that's coming up um with regard to uh this this simple statement faith without works is dead we're going to talk about that in the next chapter a couple of things here is uh just as a an aside uh, praying in the morning and giving thanks at night is just a check in it's not really your step 11 there's got to be a whole lot more that goes into it so um Giving thanks at night is great, but you want to make sure that you review your day. You want to review what didn't go quite so well, what didn't, uh, um, uh, that might need uh, some further attention, whether that's um, to, to uh, uh, eliminate a, a resentment, to approach somebody and ask them to, uh, to make something right, or on this other side of it, and this is one we don't necessarily get too much into, and that is, is that maybe something went really well. Maybe you caught yourself and and you uh, um, immediately apologized or or made something right that you wronged, and uh, and that that's all part of the exercise of living your life in in this new way and fashion. Uh, so that's also good to review and. Um, and 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 also to feel good about it. That's that's all part of this. Is you want to feel better about life, and about yourself, and about others. And that's that's part of it. Um, with the uh, um, praying in the morning is a good thing to pray for others. Uh, but you also want to sit down. And this is where you kind of outline things like your step nine. If you are going to uh, go and talk with somebody about writing uh, a wrong of some kind that's that's where you also work this as well and then i'll finish up with this on this chapter and this is something that our friend bill s said in the past and that is is live your life like it's a prayer so i think that's a really good statement i've wrote it down and uh and uh, i try to remind myself of that uh, on occasion here live your life like it's a prayer okay rob Excellent, Leo. Um, a couple of things I just want to throw in. And uh, we have uh, lights in our house. We have electricity, powers lights. If I don't go and turn on the light switch, lights aren't going to come on. I have work to do. Okay? We have responsibilities that we are supposed to do. God will look after his part. We have to look after our part. The other thing I wanted to uh, say, I don't know if everybody has heard the Dr. Bob and the camel story. I put it in the uh, the chat, uh, the little poster, but I'm going to read it out loud. The camel story. Dr. Bob would explain prayer by telling how much camels in a caravan would kneel down in the evening. And the men would unload their burdens. In the morning, they would kneel down again, and the men would put the burdens back on. It is the same with prayer, said Dr. Bob. We get on our knees to unload at night, and in the morning, when we get on our knees again, God gives us just a load we were able to carry for that day. Nice. Wow. It, it is, isn't it? You know, it's just, you know, it's something that just makes so much sense. As I said, I put that in the chat so you can uh, download it uh, for yourself. Remember all the things that we put in the chat, you know, take them or leave them, you know, as you wish. OK, I hope they help. That's why we put them in there. But, you know, not for everybody. So that's that's understandable. We're now going to working with others. Like how I put that yep. at the end of like. <laughs> and here's one of the here's another great line that I, I love. Practical experience shows that nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking as intense work with other alcoholics. It works when other activities fail. 
this is their 12th suggestion. Carry this message to other alcoholics. You can help when no one else can. You can secure their confidence when others fail. Remember, they're very ill. Yeah, so we got this started here. Um, a couple of things that we'll look at here. There's there's some really good pieces of information in this chapter, and it really starts off with a powerful one, and that is just that practical experience shows that nothing will so much as ensure immunity from drinking as intensive work with other alcoholics. I mean, right off the bat, they just tell you in a, you know, in a couple of lines exactly what our step 12 is all about and also the benefit of that step 12. And and, and doing that is, um, I, I, I can tell you, I, I, I could probably ask uh, uh, for a show of hands and I would say that probably 100% of you would say that, you know, if you're feeling, um, Weak. If you're feeling like you're the pangs of of, uh, of want and need of alcohol come up, the the point in time when you have that, if you actually reach out to another alcoholic and start to talk with them, uh, that all of a sudden uh, that that feeling uh, fades very quickly. And uh, I think that you'll be able to say that uh, um, it's it it really does do what exactly they say it does here. Um, and on top of that, um, you can help that other person um, because you've had a similar experience. You know what they're going through and um, you can secure their confidence when others fail. Obviously, when nobody's when a non-alcoholics trying to work with an alcoholic, it's it's a little bit rough. And uh, most of the time, there's a lot of resistance from the alcoholic side of things because they they just don't feel like this person's getting them. And in most cases, they probably aren't. Rob? Yeah, a couple a couple of things. Working with others, it's not a one and done. We constantly work with other people. Okay, why do we do this? Because it will ensure us immunity from drinking. Okay, it will ensure immunity. Why? Because as we take other people through the steps, we're going through them again. It reiterates, it reinforces in our minds what we have have to do in order to stay sober we have to keep that spiritual connection you know once we lose that spiritual connection and it starts drifting away slowly slowly when will the obsession return we don't know how far away that has to go until it returns but it will return so we work with other alcoholics so that we know what we're doing why we're doing things and we're turning it over to other people Remember, Dr. Bob went to Oxford meetings for two and a half years and was not getting sober. It wasn't until he sat down with Bill Wilson and realized this guy knows what he's talking about. It's the first time he's talked to an alcoholic or to another person who really understood the drinking game. You know, that's what it's all about. It says all through the book, okay, one alcoholic talking to another can get through where nobody else can. Psychiatrists, doctors. You know, treatment workers, whatever, you know, they don't seem to be able to get through to the alcoholic, but another alcoholic understands. We can get through. We can help where others can't. So please remember that. Okay. And it reinforces in us what we need to do to stay sober. So carry this message to other alcoholics. Please notice how many times it says you on this page. Life will take on new meaning. To watch people recover, to see them help others, to watch loneliness vanish, to see a fellowship grow up, up about you, to have a host of friends. This is an experience you must not miss. We know you will not want to miss it. Frequent contact with newcomers and with each other is the bright spot of our, our lives. Yeah, and this outlines kind of the fellowship of of AA and the uh, the 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 the. the the productive side of the fellowship. And that is, is meeting new people and uh, watching them uh, go through the steps and the program, watching them recover. It's, it's a very rewarding experience to do so. And um, it does, in fact, uh, they, they, they start out uh, with uh, the first sentence is life will take on new meaning. Uh, it absolutely does. It, you'll be uh, amazed at how, how different things are with you reaching out to these uh, these newcomers. 
and you know even even old timers i guess if you want to call them that it's never a bad thing to reach out to them and just kind of you know pick their brain and, or or do uh, uh compare notes with regard to uh, some of uh, your war stories compared to theirs and see kind of where you might uh, have some similarities and maybe even some differences that you can learn from each other on but this is the essence of what the fellowship is supposed to be all about and uh, um, to have that uh, friendship and uh, something that you've got to be a part of in order for this whole program to be uh, what it was meant to be. Rob? Yeah, you know, there's promises here to watch people recover, to see them help others, to watch loneliness vanish, to see a fellowship grow up about you, to have a host of friends. At the end of my drinking career, uh, which didn't pay much money, but uh, what can you do? Um, I didn't have many friends. Why? Because I, I wanted to be by myself to be able to drink. And have nobody bother me. Nobody mm -hmm. to take my drink supply. Nobody that uh, you know I had to talk to. You know, I just wanted, I isolated. You know, I just wanted to be left alone. Okay. But my personality is that I like, I like people. So when I came into the rooms of AA and got my, the, the first thing that floored me is all the people that want to hug you. You know what? I thought I was unhuggable, to be honest with you. <laughs> and, you know, and all these people that, that, that give you hugs, you know. Now, as a friend of mine always said, the reason they were hugging you, Rob, is to put the fire out <laughs> and patting you on the back. But the, the idea is that we were brought into a fellowship of people that care about to find out that are checking in on you and are asking how you're doing you know all these little things that add up you know zoom some people complain about zoom uh and the fact that you know we're so distant from each other okay kicking is in sweden i've never met her i've never met leo but you know what i know a lot about kicking i know a lot about leo and all these other people greg you know if uh, from Brooklyn, you know, all these people, I know a little bit about them. They're friends. Okay. And it's a fellowship that has grown up. And every meeting I go to, I know people. I consider them friends, good friends. I've been able to meet some of the people from different places, you know, and it's been fantastic. You know, so yes, we can complain about, uh, you know, Zoom and, uh, you know, it's not as personable, uh, you know. I've learned more in the four years of being on Zoom than I had in the other six years that I was in the fellowship where they didn't talk about the big book. They sure. didn't talk about recovery. They talked about how much they drank and how they came into the fellowship and everything they just turned rosy. So, you know, I'm going to get off my soapbox now. And uh, But I, I've met some fantastic people, and it is a bright spot for me to be able to come on to this meeting and to go to the other meetings that I go to. I look forward to it. I enjoy them. I hope you do too. Perhaps you're not acquainted with any drinkers who want to recover. You can easily find some by asking a few doctors, ministers, priests, or hospitals. They will be only too glad to assist you. Don't start out as an evangelist or reformer. Unfortunately, a lot of prejudice exists. You will be handicapped if you arouse it. Ministers and doctors are competent, and you can learn much from them if you wish. But it happens that because of your own drinking experience, you can be uniquely useful to other alcoholics. So cooperate, never criticize. To be helpful is our only aim. Yeah, there's a couple of, um, I guess I would say, warnings here. Uh, but it's it's the beginning of how uh, to seek out and approach uh, other alcoholics. You know, back when this book was written, uh, it was very much uh, uh, doctors, ministers, priests, hospitals. Um, I think in terms of today, you might find some resistance, if not complete uh, uh, door shut with doctors and hospitals because the uh, uh, doctor uh, patient confidentiality, that type of thing. But perhaps a minister or priest might be able to point you in the right direction. But really what I think, and this is uh, another plug for what um, Rob was just saying, you can get on Zoom, 
you can get into these meetings, uh, these big book meetings. You can find somebody that's uh, that's new, that's just jumping in and everything, and you can reach out to them and start working with them, if, if only to basically share your story with them, to gain their confidence and let them know that they are not alone and that there is a is a there is a program that can work if they if they want it, uh, want it it's being uh, laid at their feet and they can uh, and they can jump in and, and go um, I guess as we've said in other meetings uh, you know get in the car and uh, we'll get we'll get going so a couple of other things here is is that um, you know we just said you know being uniquely useful to other alcoholics again another alcoholic uh two alcoholics together that's that's a good thing uh working with each other in order to try to uh gain sobriety and uh recovery and uh the other part is is that you also want to cooperate um listen to what they have to say never criticize uh, that's going to just turn them off and push them away uh, that's uh, especially when they're new, uh, they're a uh, little reluctant to begin with and not quite sure of themselves. If we started criticizing them, you can kind of see where they might just say, you know, that's not for me and, and move on and maybe they don't recover at all. And really to be helpful to others is our only aim. All right. That's really just, again, you know, practical experience shows that nothing will so much as ensure immunity from drinking as intensive work with other alcoholics. That is to be helpful to those other alcoholics, and that is the only aim. Rob? And I want to go to page 18 for a moment. And in italics writing, but the ex fallen drinker who has found this solution, who is properly armed with facts about himself, can generally win the entire confidence of another alcoholic in a few hours. Until such an understanding is reached, little or nothing can be accomplished. Remember Dr. Bob and Bill when they got together. And another thing that I put into the chat, it's, it's something from uh, uh, AA Comes of Age. And it's Bill uh, talking. After six months of failure on my part to dry up any drunks, he again reminded me of Professor William James' observation that truly transforming spiritual experiences are nearly always founded on calamity and collapse. Now, this is Dr. Silkworth talking. Stop preaching at them, Dr. Silkworth had said, and give them the hard medical facts first. Bill was trying to, was telling people about his white light experience. Not everyone has that. Okay, I did not have that. So I would not be able to relate to a white light experience. But spiritual awakening, I can understand. Okay, slowly, slowly it came into my being. Okay, that I believed that this could work. Now, I, I mentioned earlier, 13 times you is used on this one page. Okay, we are now included in this. Okay, before it was all about the first 100 people. Now we can do this. We are a part of the collective now. Congratulations. Page 80, uh, page 90, everybody. When you discover a prospect for Alcoholics and Honor, find out all you can about him. If he does not want to stop drinking, don't waste time trying to persuade him. He may spoil a later opportunity. This advice is given for his family also. They should be patient, realizing that they are dealing with a sick person. Yeah, so a couple of things here. Um, you know, you, you've reached out to somebody. They aren't quite sure where they are. They basically tell you that they're not ready to stop drinking, that they don't. They, they might even tell you that they're not even sure they have a problem, that they're not convinced yet. Um, just just talk with them. Uh, perhaps make friends with them, but uh, don't push them in any direction. Uh, just let them know that you're available and uh, and, 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 and then you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with checking in with them, you know, at a later date, not necessarily the very next day, perhaps, but, you know, something down the road, one or two weeks down the road, just to check and see how they're doing that type of thing and letting them know that you're still available. Um, I don't think is going to be too bothersome. Um, this, this, this thing too is, um, you know, with the family, if you have access to the family, great. Again, we live in an age where that's not necessarily the case as much as it probably was back in the late 1930s, early 1940s. Um, but nonetheless, it is something that uh, if you can get to maybe a spouse, a partner, um, you know, uh, 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 
something like that and just let them know that you have been through what they're kind of going through to some extent and that you understand uh, alcoholism and uh, are ready to be a part of and or participate and or uh, help the other person if they are open to that. Um, it's, it's always a good idea to just reinforce that uh, the alcoholic is a sick person and to treat them uh, as such. So um, that's, that's really where we are at this point. Um, the big message here is, is don't push. Uh, listen at first. If they are open to listening to you, then obviously you want to tell your story. It's really to uh, gain their confidence and that they kind of have that, you know, I've been through that um, kind of thing. Uh, but at the same time, if they're not ready, they're not ready and don't waste your time. Rob? Yeah, we plant the seed. We let them know that we are available when they're ready. Okay. And if they're not ready at this time, so, be, you know, a lot of people come in and what they want is all the consequences to just go away, to get people off their back. Okay. I've, I've worked with a few people like that. I'm waiting for them to come back to me. You know, I planted the seed. I'm here when you're ready. Okay. I am the man with an answer. Okay. You know, I can help you. Okay. But until you want to do the work, and accept responsibility. Remember, step one, we learned. We had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholic. Okay, we learned. How do we learn? Because we look over our past. Okay, but not everybody learns at the same speed or at the same time. So we plant the seed and we hope that it takes root. Okay. If there is any indication that he wants to stop, have a good talk with the person most interested in him. Usually his wife. Get an idea of his behavior, his problems, his background, the seriousness of his condition, and his religious leaning. You need this information to put yourself in his place to see how you would like him to approach you if the tables were turned. Yeah, it's really just uh, we're, we're going through an instructive uh, uh, part here. Uh, this is good uh, information. If you have the ability to talk with somebody about this person, um, it's it's always good. I would emphasize confidence here and uh, confidentiality so that if somebody is sharing this information with you, that you keep it close hold and not share it with others. Uh, that's not the intent uh, at all. So I just want to make that clear. And um, getting to know this person as best you can certainly gives you the opportunity to figure out how best to approach them. And that's really the simple, the simple message here. Rob? Yeah, I just want to go to page 77 for a second. Our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and the people about us. Hmm. Sometimes it is wise to wait till he goes on a binge. The family may object to this, but unless he is in a dangerous physical condition, it is better to risk it. Don't deal with him when he is very drunk, unless he is ugly and the family needs your help. Wait for the end of the spree, or at least for a lucid interval. Then let his family or a friend ask him if he wants to quit for good and if he would go to any extreme to do so. If he says yes, then his attention should be drawn to you as a person who has recovered. You should be described to him as one of a fellowship who, as part of their own recovery, try to help others and who will be glad to talk to him if he cares to see you. Yeah, it's a good message here to uh, to relate to them that you uh, are an alcoholic, that you've been through uh, a similar uh, type of uh, situation that they have been through. If you have an opportunity to give a, an example or two just to uh, show that, that's great. Um, the um, um, and at this point, when he's when he's at a vulnerable state, meaning that after a spree, after a ben, a bender, um, they are at that point where they just don't want to drink again. For example, it's a good idea at that point to maybe approach them and uh, talk about this fellowship that you're a part of. And again, we talk about the fellowship as being a group of recovered alcoholics and or recovering alcoholics that are um, uh, looking for a better life, a better place in, in this society, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, you know, you're, you're part of that fellowship. 
You're not part of a program. There's a program that we um, adhere to, but we're not part of the program. We're part of the fellowship. And that's, again, we just described what the good part of the fellowship is and what it is not. Um, the idea is that you're there to help that person and uh, others, and you should express that to them so that they know that they've got somebody they can turn to if 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 they so choose. Rob? Yeah. If he does not want to see you, never force yourself upon him. Neither should the family hysterically plead with him to do anything, nor should they tell him much about you. They should wait for the end of his next drinking boat. You might place this book where you can see it in the interval. Here, no specific rule can be given. The family must decide these things, but urge them not to be over anxious, for that might spoil matters. Yeah, it's difficult to do in practice. Um, there is a desperation that I think that uh, family members and friends uh, feel with regard to uh, the alcoholic. It shows that they care, uh, but it also shows a lack of understanding. And uh, it also shows that they're really concerned about themselves more so than they are about the individual. So uh, having them try to um, um, set aside uh, some of that um, um, craziness is, is, is a good thing. And um, approaching this in a calm, uh, unemotional way, I think is, is really what they're uh, also uh, an underlying message here. Placing the book is just an example of how you might approach this person um, if they have an if you have an opportunity to get them a book. Um, you know, we haven't at this point talked about getting into the book. We just merely are showing that there is a book that you've expressed to them that there is a program that you have uh, subscribed to, and uh, and and at that point, um, you you can help them walk through the steps and 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 put them on a road to recovery. Um, no specific rule can be given. Obviously, each situation is different. So you kind of have to uh, feel your way through it. But um, the good news is, is that we're in a chapter right now that gives you a lot of examples and a lot of direction so that you can probably find a mix here of good, uh, uh, good things to approach an alcoholic on, especially given that they're uh, brand new and uh, have expressed at least some interest in, in quitting. Remember, we go back up to the top, to, uh, up at the top. If he does not want to stop drinking, don't waste time trying to persuade him. We're not here to try and, and push somebody in that direction. It's never going to work. You really want somebody to say uh, unequivocally that they are uh, ready to stop drinking. And most of the time, the family wants them to quit long before the alcoholic wants to quit. You yes. know, and they're, you know, they see all the crap that the other person's going through, and they will do anything, anything. But until that person wants to stop, there's nothing you can do. I want to go to page XXIX just for a moment. After they have succumbed to the desire again, as so many do, and the phenomenon of craving develops, they pass through the well-known stages of a spree, emerging remorseful with a firm resolution not to drink again. This is repeated over and over, and I'm going to add an extra over. Uh, and unless this person can experience an entire second chain, there's very little hope of his recovery. Unless he wants it or she wants it, there's nothing any of us can do. Okay. So please remember that. Usually the family should not try to tell your story. When possible, avoid meeting a man through his family. Approach through a doctor or an institution is a better bet. If your man needs hospitalization, he should have it. But not forcibly unless he is violent. Let the doctor, if he will, tell him he has something in the way of his solution. So again, this is a mix from the 1930s and 40s uh, in regards to some of this. But now we would go to um, a recovery center and uh, um, and try to uh, go through some level of detox, that type of thing. Um, it, it, that's something I think that is more acceptable these days to be able to talk about it with the individual, especially if they're showing signs of wanting to uh, to recover and, and become a sober person. Um, you know, meeting uh, a person through their family, 
uh, and, and talking about these things sometimes can get emotional and you want to avoid that. You also want to avoid embarrassing the individual in front of family and friends. Uh, so uh, approaching them, I think, individually more than anything else is probably a good way to keep some confidence and uh, confidentiality in it. And, and, and going with that. Um, I, again, I don't think you're going to probably be able to work through a doctor um, or an institution uh, that, again, from that doctor-patient confidentiality and the, uh, the uh, lack of, uh, of ability to really share that kind of information just doesn't happen these days. Um, and, um, you know, the good news is, is that a lot of, a lot of doctors and a lot of counselors uh, out there will at least suggest that uh, AA has a program of recovery, and perhaps that's something that they should look into. It's always nice to get some kind of a third-party um, recommendation, and that does help kind of open the door uh, a little bit because now they're hearing it from not only you, but they're hearing it from other people, uh, especially professionals uh, as well, and that does happen on occasion. So, um, but if 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 in fact you have the opportunity to uh, uh, to talk, you know, at this point we're just basically saying that there is a program of solution uh, that is a that is a solution to alcoholism, and perhaps that they would be interested in doing that if they need to get um, uh, uh, detoxed and uh, go through a program of recovery uh, to start with, say a thirty day program or something like that to uh, to really kind of get themselves primed and ready to go, uh, then let them do that. And uh, at that point, um, we can, we'll can we we'll talk more about staying in touch with them and if they're in a program like that. Rob? When your man is better, the doctor might suggest a visit from you. Though you have talked with the family, leave them out of the first discussion. Under these conditions, your prospect will see he's under no pressure. He will feel he can deal with you without being nagged by his family. Call on him while he is still jittery. He may be more receptive when depressed. Yeah, and that's really a, a, a what we've already said here, so won't say too much here. Um, talking with them without the family there, again, it just avoids that, uh, uh, that hey, see, here, this person is recovered. You can do this. Why can't you do this? You know, how come you haven't already done what this person's done, et cetera? Um, it just really sets things up for, for failure, and uh, you don't want that, so... Um, getting them when they're when they're at that point of uh, recovery uh, just after a, a bender is is has proven to be uh, also very positive and can and can pay dividends with regard to their receptiveness um, to to uh, to the program and listening to you. Rob, see your man alone if possible. At first, engage in general conversation. After a while, turn the talk to some phase of drinking. Tell him enough about your drinking habits, symptoms, and experiences to encourage him to speak of himself. If he wishes to talk, let him do so. You will thus get a better idea of how you ought to proceed. If he is not communicative, give him a sketch of your drinking career up to the time you quit, but say nothing for the moment of how that was accomplished. If he is in a serious mood, dwell on the troubles liquor has caused you. Being careful not to moralize your lecture. If his mood is light, tell him humorous stories of your escapade. Get him to tell some of his. Yeah, this is really in that uh, gaining the confidence of the other person, and we're really just getting into the to the, the details of that. Um, and we're talking about uh, telling a few of your war stories. Really what you're trying to do is relate or uh, to the other person or show that other person that you understand uh, the things that they're going through to some extent. And that some of the uh, your stories will most likely be very similar to their stories. Obviously, they're two different people, so this the the you know where they are, what was happening, that type of thing is certainly going to be different. But the uh, the, the the things leading up to it, the activity of drinking, and uh, and and the the shutting off of people, uh, the drinking alone, et cetera. All of those things are things that we've all kind of experienced at some point and uh, they can they can um, relate to that. And the idea here is really just to get them to open up, to feel comfortable, not pressured, and uh, give them the uh, the point of where they start to uh, talk and tell of their stories. 
And this is important uh, with regard to how to proceed because you really want to listen when they are when they actually start talking. Um, it's a good idea to really kind of understand where they're coming from, and in doing so, it's going to give you. It's going to be very instructive as to how you want to go uh, about your next steps in regards to uh, to working with them, and maybe. You know, you've shared a couple of stories with them and they share a couple of stories with you. Maybe one of their stories, you've got something that's even more relatable to it that you want to share with them. Again, you're really just trying to, you know, solidify that foundation of the relationship uh, in regards to uh, the fact that both of you have been going through very similar things. And that is relatable. And uh, it's also very desirable to uh, be a part of. It's no longer going to be, you know, the the nagging uh, non-alcoholic uh, family member uh, that that is just really more interested in uh, themselves than they are really in the individual, uh, even if it doesn't appear that way. Rob? Now, one of the things I, I love about the big book is that they go over things constantly. You know, they don't just tell you once, they tell you numerous times. I want to go back to page 18 for a moment right now, because this will... Uh, reinforce what we just talked about that the man who is making the approach has had the same difficulty that he obviously knows what he is talking about that his whole deportment shouts at the new prospect that he is a man with a real answer that he has no attitude of holier than thou nothing whatever except the sincere desire to be helpful that there are no dues to feed to pay no axes to grind no people to please no lectures to be endured these are the conditions we have found most effective after such an approach, many take up their beds and walk again. So it just reinforces what we've just talked about, okay, of how we approach the person. When he sees you know all about the drinking game, commence to describe yourself as an alcoholic. Tell him how baffled you were, how you finally learned that you were sick. Give him an account of the struggles you made to stop. Show him the mental twist which leads to the first drink of a spree. We suggest you do this as we have done it in the chapter on alcoholism. If he is an alcoholic, he will understand you at once. He will match your mental inconsistencies with some of his own. Absolutely. And and I like the I like it how they start this paragraph is tell him how baffled you were, uh, how you finally learned that you were sick. Because that is really the crux of a lot of the beginnings of a of a newcomer. And that is is that they're they're just they don't understand. They 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 haven't been given the information so they're um the, they're not knowledgeable in in regards to what actually an alcoholic is uh what is alcoholism what is it that, to uh, to be in the situation that they're in and when you hand them this book and you can actually refer to the pages in here more about alcoholism and really educate them on it and they can kind of start to say oh my gosh i fit that or i i'm, I'm just like that etc it's um you know it you basically are saying, look, I was I was not in the know. I was baffled by where I was at. Um, but you know, you want to be specific and 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 really kind of talk about it. But I think what's what we're trying to get here is is that you're going to relate. This is one of those relatable type type of things. They're they're coming to you completely ignorant with regard to what alcoholism is, and this is a great opportunity to. Uh, uh, to start to share with them, to start, okay, to share with them um, uh, the uh, uh, of, of of how baffled you were, and 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 really, I think a good another word is, is struggling. You know, you struggle to stop. You don't know why you can't stop. You 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 think that you can white knuckle it, and perhaps you can for one to three days or or a week. Um, but you find yourself right back in it again and uh, completely discouraged, uh, demoralized and, and feeling very helpless with regard to uh, whether or not you're going to be able to lick this or kick it. And in the meantime, you've got people, you know, all over you about why can't you stop? Um, it just really is a, a recipe for disaster. So this is a very important place to be in that uh, the person's uh, beginning of their recovery and, and showing that um, you you have it. Um, and this is really um, where you start to reference things back to the big book. Um, and you can really, it's, well, that's where we are. 
Rob? Yeah, I want to go to page 157 for a moment. And I want to talk about Bill Dotson for a moment, who is the A number three. Hopelessness was written large on the man's face as he replied, oh, but that's no use. Nothing would fix me. I'm a goner. The last three times I got drunk on the way home from here. I'm afraid to go out the door. I can't understand it. For an hour, the two friends told him about their drinking experiences. Over and over, he would say, that's me. That's me. I drink like that. The man in the bed was told of the acute poisoning from which he suffered, how it deteriorates the body of an alcoholic and warps his mind. That was, there was much talk about the mental state perceiving the first drink. Yes, that's me, said the sick man. The very image. You fellows know your stuff all right, but I don't see what good it'll do me. You fellows are somebody. I was once, but I'm a nobody now. From what you tell me, I know more than ever. I can't stop. At, the, at this, both the visitors burst into a laugh. To the future fellow El Anonymous, damn little laugh about that I can see. The two friends spoke of their spiritual experience and told him about the course of action they carried out. And this is what it's all about, is that, you know, we share experiences and, and uh, our knowledge of what we have learned. And if the person wants it, we work with them. And that's what it's all about. Leo, it is uh, 12.52. We want to bring in uh, Mr. Bill. Hopefully yes, I'll tell a grass cutting story. <laughs> I, I love that. I love that story. And and it I think it's a, a so Bill, I hope you're gonna tell that grass cutting story. Oh. You there, Bill? Yeah, hi, this is Bill all from New Jersey. Hey, Bill. Excellent guys, good job. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we, we went through the end of uh uh, of uh, step 11 uh, and basically step 11 uh, well, there's something that we need to do uh, uh, if you're not praying and meditating you're missing a really big important part of this and then we move on to chapter 7 and this first sentence in chapter 7 this is one of my favorite things in this book practical experience shows that nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking as intensive work with other alcoholics and alcoholics has an S on it. That means we keep on doing this. This book is telling me that nothing, nothing means nothing. Nothing is going to keep me sober or ensure immunity from drinking more than doing step 12. Not doing step one five times a day. Not doing step two. Not writing the fourth step every other month. Not doing the ninth step over and over and over again. Not doing the 11th step 24-7. This book says, Nothing is going to keep me sober more than intensive work with other alcoholics. And what is intensive work? Intensive work is taking someone through this program, walking them through the 12-step process, walking through this book. That's what intensive work means. And nothing's going to keep me sober more than that. Not doing any, all the rest of the steps. This is, this is the most important thing for keeping us sober. This is the treatment for alcoholism is trying to help somebody else achieve sobriety. That's what treats alcoholism. And if you don't treat your alcoholism, you're going to have untreated alcoholism. And that's not good because you're going to wind up either on a, on a dry drunk or a wet drunk. So this is the most uh, important thing in this book as far as I'm concerned. This is telling me what I need to do so I can stay sober. This, this gives me this whole thing right, right here. And, uh, like Rob pointed out, and uh, you was used 13 times on this page. Before, the, before this chapter, they were always talking about us or them or we or he or whatever. Now this book is talking directly to you. You are now part of this. This book is giving us instructions. It's telling you exactly what you're supposed to do. And, it, and Bill's giving instructions here on how to deal with an alcoholic, on how to carry the message to them how we're supposed to work with others. Over and over again, it keeps saying the same thing. We're supposed to carry this message to someone else. Why? Because that's what keeps us sober. And Rob wants to hear my grass story. Okay, I'll tell you my grass story. <clears throat> I made this up uh, years ago because one of my sponsees asked me, uh, why do I have to work with, uh, with other alcoholics? Why can't I just help anybody? And I had to pray and meditate on it and think about it for a while. And the answer that I came up with was, if you just work with anybody, say, for example, 
somebody on your block breaks their foot and they can't cut their grass. Okay, so I'm going to be a good neighbor. I'm going to volunteer to cut the person's grass for them so they don't get in trouble with the town, get a ticket for not cutting their grass or whatever. So what is that going to do for me? That's going to make a real good grass cutter out of me because I'm getting more practice at cutting somebody else's grass. Now, I don't know what that'll do for my sobriety, but when my guy to cut my own grass, it'll be a little bit easier for me because I already got my lawnmower in shape and full of, full of gas and have the blade all cleaned off and I have more practice at cutting somebody else's grass. It's going to be a little bit easier for me to cut my grass. Whether that's going to keep me sober or not, I don't know. Now, if I use some of my spare time to try to help another alcoholic achieve sobriety by walking them through this program, I'm getting more practice and using this program with another alcoholic. <clears throat> now, when I'm a little bit jittery or I'm a on shaky ground or whatever, I'm having a rough time, it'll be easier for me to incorporate this program into my own life because I've had more practice using it with someone else. That's why we try to help other alcoholics. It makes our sobriety stronger. That, that's the whole point of this. If you don't try to carry this message to someone else, you basically wasted your whole time going through the first 11 steps. They'll, they may help you a little bit, but if you really want to achieve sobriety and you want to stay sober and you don't want to have to keep uh, fighting off a drink every single day, go work with another alcoholic. That's going to keep you sober more than anything else that you can come up with. And that's exactly what this book says right here. This, this to me, is the, mo is the most spiritual exercise that you can do in AA. It's mentioned something like 72 times in the first 164 pages. It's mentioned about working with others and working with other alcoholics. And when the book says working with others, it, it's directed towards other alcoholics because this book is oriented towards alcoholics, alcoholism, and how to recover from it. So basically, that's, that's what this whole uh, chapter is about, working with others, we're supposed to do that. Why? Because it keeps us sober. Bill Wilson said this. He said, we don't work with others because they're alcoholics. We work with other alcoholics because we're alcoholics. And step 12 mandates us to do this. The second part of step 12 says, try to carry this message to other alcoholics. That's not a optional. That's a mandatory. That, if you want to do the, the steps, step 12 is telling us, we have to carry this message to others. And it doesn't say we have to succeed. It just says we have to try to carry the message. Whether they get sober or not is neither here nor there. As long as you're carrying this message to someone else, that's what's going to keep you sober more than anything else. If they get sober, that's a bonus. I mean, so basically, this, this chapter is telling us what we need to do so we can stay sober and we don't have to fight off a drink and white knuckle it all the time. That's pretty much all I got. Thanks a lot for letting me share. Thank you so much, Bill. And thanks for telling the grass story. When Bill first told me that story or said it in a meeting, it made so much sense to me. Okay. Why do I work with others? It makes sense I, because I it reinforces what I need to do. The light bulb went off. Is 100% chicken. The light bulb went off in my head. So, Bill, thank you for telling that story. I love it. Sorry, Leo. No, no, don't apologize. That was great. This is all good. Thanks. That was awesome, Bill. Um, let's go ahead and close out with serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can. Wisdom to know the difference. <laughs>